there is over a trillion dollars of waste in supply chains today. The net zero carbon emission is something that corporates are taking very seriously. To meet these objectives, they're going to have to take into consideration CO2 emissions. Hey, and thanks for hanging with us this far through the Net Zero Carbon Summit. Welcome back to another Fireside Chat. I'm Tyler Cole, and I have the honor of being joined by Rick Renz, the director of the Sustainable Freight Buyers Alliance, which is part of Smart Freight Center. Rick, good afternoon. How are you? Hi there. Um, good afternoon as well, and a pleasure to have you here, at Tyler. Good to see you again. You're a uh, previous guest on the Net Zero Carbon Show and previous summit, so we're really excited to have you back, not least because uh, new role, new title, new initiatives. Why don't we why don't we start there and let you share a little bit about what's been going on with you and the organization? Yeah, it, it, it's been a super exciting journey actually in the last uh, year and a half of the since the launch of the Sustainable Freight Buyers Alliance when we when we initiated the group of companies that were say, willing to take the next steps towards saying can we actually take collective action? Um, and in the last year and a half, we have been able to grow the alliance now to a fifty plus companies that are actively collaborating to reduce their emissions. Um, true collaborative efforts, knowledge sharing, and collective action. So um, it's been an absolute journey to see uh, the biggest players in the world coming together, seeking to do this collaboration to reduce the logistics emissions. Well, congrats to you and the team. It's no no secret that I'm a, a huge fan of Smart Freight Center and the work that you've done, not only to promote and uh, expand the GLEC framework, now with ISO 14083, um, the collaborative spirit of what you guys bring to the industry, I think, is invaluable. So, number one, off the top, thanks to you and the team for the work you did. I appreciate that, Tyler. And, and, and but we we also believe it's also essential, and it's it, it's really at the core of. Um, I always see Smart Freight Center is really a center for for of gravity about freight decarbonization, and whatever is needed in the market, you can't do this alone. So, this collaborative nature. We don't have all the answers either, but through this collaborative of, of working together with other partners, um, we've been successful at least in understanding what, what logistics emissions look like, how to exchange logistics emissions, and now also how do we actually decarbonize through collective action, um, in, in particularly in the road freight sector. Well, that's probably where we need to jump right in. We've had listeners who've hung with us this far throughout the day hearing about alternative technologies and collaborative efforts and measurement, data. Uh, I want to launch into some specific real-world applications that you guys are seeing emerge out of the work you're doing. So um, why don't you explain just a little bit more about the maybe the structure of um, sustainable freight buyers and then some of the projects you guys are working on? Yeah, happy to. So we actually, um, we the Sustainable Freight Buyers Alliance is focused around four critical components. Um, the first and foremost is actually the, the design of collective projects. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. What does, does that mean in, in certain examples of, of in the road freight sector, but also in intermodal solutions? Secondly, um, what companies struggle in and the transition which is taking place now, if we want to get to zero emission logistics or as low emission logistics, it needs to be embedded within procurement. So how do you actually procure zero emission logistics? It's easy to say, I want a truck to run on the road. It's more difficult to say, I oh, want to run an electric truck on the road. Um, that's not as a, a straightforward answer now today. And how can we make that transition? And thirdly, is to also inform and discuss particularly the legislative surroundings and the enabling environment there. Recognizing that especially policy is becoming tighter and tighter over time and is also very much welcomed. But it puts a requirement to the companies as well to make that work and also to influence some of those discussions to the positive side of things um, to make them even more working towards a, a 1.5 degree scenario. And finally, last but not least, um, is actually the design of uh, of a partnership. You can't, you, as, as, as I mentioned, you need to do this together. And we're hosting several events together just to allow also best practice sharing. What a one company can do can actually be replicated by the others. Um, and that partnership is critical. And to, for instance, we see uh, finally, and then I'll, I'll pause again, is to see, for instance, our partner organization. So there's the Sustainable Freight Buyers Alliance, but there's, for instance, also the Sustainable Aviation Buyers Alliance, or the Zero Emission Maritime Buyers Alliance, which respectively work on the aviation and maritime side specifically, um, which are also successful in their own right to decarbonize some of these supply chains here. Those are important kind of pillars of focus to remember that you guys work on. If I could summarize, uh, not only bringing the parties together and helping design 
projects together, but being an advocate for policy influence um, to demonstrate demand aggregation and just signals to the market. Uh, probably just try and stay ahead of regulations in some regard too. But then working outside of even Smart Freight with other buying alliances, because I'm sure members could belong to each and there's no restrictions on that. You kind of have to play together because we need all solutions. Is that fair That's summary? Right. That's an absolute summary. And, and But don't forget about the element of, of procurement these days as well. We need to kind of bridge that gap between procurement professionals and sustainability professionals here. And I'm glad you came back to procurement because that's that's a big piece of what's going on currently in the organization. Could we talk about why that's such a big deal? Meaning, um, what are the hurdles for procuring a lot of these decarbonized solutions, specifically maybe electric trucks? And how does you know collaborating and trying to ensure best practices and bringing more people to the table, how does that help overcome some of those hurdles? Yeah, um, the role of procurement is critical here because if you think about the any supply chains, specifically about road freight, most often companies have outsourced their logistics. Um, so they only ask, like, can you move my goods from A to B? That company then is generally outsourced again to a smaller medium enterprise. If you think then about the transition to electric trucks, smaller medium enterprises need to invest almost double the amount of money to get to an electric truck, given the capex costs of those solutions are much higher. Electric trucks simply are two times more expensive today than a, than a combustion engine truck. Um, that in itself provides a, is, is a real challenge to, to be overcome. Whereas at the same time, the ones that are paying for the freight, the freight buyers at the, at the far end, are under pressure to decarbonize the supply chain and are willing to make that change. And we help them to actually aggregation of demand. So understanding what's the volume of transportation that's going to be to put, be put out there and the willingness to transition to electric trucks. And um, then how can we actually design a collective tender to allow a reduction of, 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 of a purchase of electric trucks um, to enter the market sooner as well as cheaper, um, which is much needed here. Absolutely right. And it, it's interesting you mentioned that structure because we've seen similar um, you know, tenders or collective um, RFPs in the past, specifically out of Saba with sustainable aviation fuel, buyers coming together sort of through a reverse RFP to try and get that limited supply both um, in the market and available, but also send demand signals for more to come. And I think many of those have been oversubscribed. Are we seeing similar um, initiatives coming out of your group? Absolutely. So we, we so just to, to one of our partner organizations, Zemba, did a similar exercise for the container industry to procure zero emissions as uh, maritime fuels. And we are currently designing the tender for pr procuring um, 10,000 electric trucks, actually, in, in collaboration with our partner um, uh, accordingly, for specifically for the US and European markets. So how can we actually create the demand for these electric trucks? And then we're talking not about the small delivery vans. Uh, the delivery vans you can buy, this is by talking about the class eight, heavy duty, long range uh, type of trucks that, that need to be decarbonized here. That's exciting. And we're getting a lot more data out there in the market. In fact, during the summit, we're still getting results back from um, NACFI's run on less electric campaign. So we're seeing some real world applications of lots of different fleet types. Um, it's exciting to hear that that sort of demand size is coming to the market because the market has been waiting for this solution. And I think everyone's been skeptical and we're starting to inch closer and closer to reality at scale or some small scale, at least for the solution. It, it's funny um, that you mention it because what one of the things which we've been realizing whilst we started to do this analysis, what's the demand, what's the volumes that our p companies are willing to look like? What's the cost of a, of a truck going to look like as well? What we recognize now is that cost parity between a running a diesel truck and, and a new electric truck is, is within reach. Certain segments have already achieved and within two years, it's in reach for all of the virtually all of the segments here, which means that if you in two years decide to purchase a combustion engine truck, you might actually start running a, you losing money if you um, rather than winning money from an electric truck. And that will change the dynamics of this, the market in, enormously already. Especially when you come on the scale with shippers already wanting this solution, right? So you're not even talking about bottom line net profits. You're talking about top line revenue opportunities coming from customers who want to pay for the solution. There's a willingness to pay for this. There's a willingness to to invest in this. Also willingness to shape this type of solution. So recognizing this will also require for freight buyers 
to extend their contracts, to change some of their contracting procedures. But we see that trains gradually happening now, um, uh, very quickly. Um, we'll see electric trucks entering the market on every segment as we speak. Is there a variance in either willingness to pay or appetite from fleets in geographical differences? So in Europe versus in call it California, uh, I know there's incentives and carrots and sticks in both, but are you seeing a, more of an appetite on this side of the pond versus yours or not really? I, I would say it's, it's actually um, driven by different dynamics. Um, the incentive structure in the US is better than it is in the European market. The European market is more pushed through the existing regulations that's being proposed by 2030 here. Um, and now I'm talking about the US market outside of the California market, which has probably the most strict pro uh, legislation in place as we speak. Um, I don't see any fundamental differences between the two there. Um, outside of the incentive structures, which makes it sometimes more attractive to invest in the US than in Europe today. Sure. Well, and it's interesting because in many cases, a lot of these probably members of sustainable freight buyers operate heavily in both, and it's the fleet profile that's a little bit different. Yeah. we So we have seen one or two companies that have made the shift actually to prioritize the US over Europe. Um, so the European Union needs to get their act together, I would say, in, in passing the legislation here as soon as possible. And then I think there'll be a, a good incentive for the European market again. We're seeing that across a lot of sectors, but that's interesting to hear. What, um, for listeners that are not involved with smart freight buyers and are just maybe even getting started on this journey, can you offer a little bit of advice to them? Are you guys looking for more members? Um, what's an ideal opportunity for them to find similar collaborative uh, kind of principles to apply when they're out there working with customers? Absolutely. So if you, um, any company that is, we, what we actually see now, we see a huge influx of companies that are at the early stages of their journey. They realize they're under pressure for reducing their emissions. They, they have maybe contemplated setting a carbon target. Um, and we help companies throughout that journey. So we help them in understanding how do you actually calculate and report your emissions and how do you set a target, which is also in line with the science-based targets initiative. So we actually provide the guidance. How do you do that type of work? And then we can help you also design that collective action um, afterwards that's needed to help you decarbonize that and understanding from your peers and, and partners to do so. Um, so I, generally speaking, I would say it's an ideal opportunity for you to, to start engaging. Um, also recognizing that this is not only a market anymore for the US and the European markets, but today also... Um, quite actively in China and India, and even scoping in, in uh, Eastern Africa. So recognizing that supply chains across the world need to be decarbonized and not just in, in certain segments. That's also a great reminder for me. I often get Western Europe and, and uh, US centric in most of the work that I'm doing. And, and a lot of the progress we're seeing is happening in EMEA and developing markets. And that's really the opportunity to leapfrog technology wise in many cases. Yeah. Exactly. And and that's where we see also some of the, the eagerness now from companies to start engaging there as well um, and to take some of those steps, um, recognizing that not, well, not to say that the European and American markets are solved, not at all. <laughs> <I always. laughs> also a good disclaimer. You're exactly, exactly right. We've got a long way to go. <laughs> we still have some ways to go, yeah. Exciting. Well, is there anything on the horizon? Uh, you already mentioned uh, potential electric vehicle demand aggregation and RFP. Um, any other work streams or projects that you guys are working on or that you can mention at least? I, I would say what, what, what excites me most at this point in time is that we at Smart Freight Center now have a, a full suite of kind of working on the maritime aviation and, and, and on the road freight side of things together. Um, so an open invitation here um, to join us in that space. Um, but what excites me most here is, 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 is this two things. One, that we actually able to transition towards electric trucks and that they are ready to enter the market as soon as possible in, in the next coming years and, and to, to see where a collective tender can land accordingly. And secondly, what I'm super excited about is, is slightly outside of the conversation we had today, but it is a piece of technology that allows peer-to-peer -peer technology of data exchange, understanding that under where your carbon emissions come from and how your supply chain looks like. Um, I think there's a, we've done a proof of concept and, and we're ready to scale that um, in the months to come. So I'm super excited about that prospect, so to say, of creating carbon transparency. 
where do you see the primary value in that sort of initiative for both fleets and shippers? If you want to understand your carbon emissions, you need to be able to collect your data across probably a few thousand suppliers. Um, and we make that kind of technology available to allow you to do exactly that. Um, so we overcome that problem uh, of for you to connect to a few thousand suppliers. Um, okay. I can see the value in that. I want to make sure the listeners got out of it. It is a, uh, a problem for the procurement team, even tying it back to your point. We're being tasked and pressured from leadership to reduce emissions within the supply chain and logistics. We've got to have good measurement. And we know that we're all on a journey to improve our data, starting with activity-based averages is a great place to start, but we quickly want to get more accurate and precise. And to do that, we've got to connect with the suppliers themselves, which at a load level, is not the easiest thing to do. It's exactly. You and I can make a back-of-the-envelope calculation of, of what the carbon emissions of a truck in the US are. That's where the GLEC framework also provides you exactly how it should be done. But then getting to the nitty-gritty of understanding where your carbon hotspots are requires for you to, to not only follow the GLEC framework, but then also to engage with all of your suppliers accordingly. And um, that's what we try to make available here through this piece of technology. Um, Exciting. One of the biggest hurdles there in the past has been a willingness uh, to trust, right? And to share data. Is that through a platform concern able to be addressed? Yeah, so th this is where some of this, this, this is why I'm so excited about this because it, it create the new trust is being created through a peer to peer technology. So it's, it's a federated system in tech, in, for the IT specialists under us. Um, so there is no central authority here. So there's no central place where data is being stored. So it's just between you and me that exchange, the data can be exchanged. Um, and no one else will have that ex access. Um, so it's quite innovative. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk to talk to you more about that in the next versions as well. We will definitely have you on for that. You're doing a great job of dancing around the buzzfield mind, the, the minds of the buzzfield words. Now I'm gonna say it again. We'll talk about that in a future episode for sure, because that's exciting to me. And you're doing a great job of dancing around uh, the minefield of buzzwords like blockchain and decentralization and transparency, which may or may not play a role. We can we can talk about that later. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Well, well, blockchains is for sure not the way to go in this case. So, <laughs> fair, fair, fair. So, leave our listeners with something positive. I always want to try and end uh, anytime I'm on camera uh, with something that uh, leaves us encouraged as we walk away. So, what's what's the most encouraging thing that you see on the horizon um, for the industry to decarbonize? I would say that the um, the notion that greenhouse gas emission reductions are being made possible. So. What we see, what we've seen in the last two years, logistics emissions are being reduced. Companies are able to grow their operations and reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Something that was two years ago was not even thinkable about like how do you actually reduce it was always about efficiencies and reductions. Nowadays, the technology has become real. Road freight electrification is, is around the corner for every single segment. Um, and what I find most promising is that I see companies now really making that shift, demanding it from their clients. Um, and I think within a few years, you'll see a revolutionized um, logistics insect in that space with, with true decarbonization taking place. Viva la logistics decarbonization revolution. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's, That's, a That's a good summary. That's a good summary. Yeah. Rick, thanks again for joining us today. Congrats to you and the team for all the success and excited about the opportunities in the future to keep this journey going forward. Great job this week at Climate Week with all the things that came out of it for you and the team. And uh, on behalf of me and the listeners, thanks for encouraging us. Thank you so much, Tyler, for having you, me, and uh, good luck on the Net Zero Summit today. There is over a trillion dollars of waste in supply chains today. The Net Zero carbon emission is something that corporates are taking very seriously. To meet these objectives, they're going to have to take into consideration CO2 emissions.